Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, did it work? Did it do the thing? I think it did the thing. Hold on. I'm, ch I'm checking if it did the thing. Did we do it? Did, did we do it? <gasps> I think it's working. Oh. Oh, it's working. Oh, it's working. Yes. Got him. Oh my god. Yes. Cool, 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 cool. Okay. Um, I'll probably gotta, like wait a couple minutes just so people can like hop into the stream and all that. But uh, in the meantime, we can just, uh, oh, I don't know. Look at some of this uh, neato medieval art. <laughs> because yes, danger rabbits. You know, they're just, they're just taking this dude <laughs> somewhere. I don't know. They're just like, hey, you're coming with us now. <laughs> Sweet. Yes. Okay, cool. We did get it. Nice, nice. Oh my god. <laughs> this is uh, so beautiful. I mean, okay. Here's the thing you need to remember about this like period of art. And like I said, we're just doing... This is like pre-game show, so don't worry. We'll actually get to the panel in a second. Um, they weren't really too focused on like anatomy. It was just more like these are like side vignettes on the side of whatever Bible or text they were writing. So it was just kind of like little humorous things kind of like pass the time whenever they were bored, more or less, for the monks. <laughs> so, um, you know, you'd get stuff like this. Because <laughs> uh, a lot of people have never really seen like giant lizards before like oh i've heard of this thing called a komodo dragon i wonder what that's supposed to look like i'll try and interpret what people have just told me <laughs> and you end up with stuff like this is like it's kind of like a fish but not really i mean i don't know what fish this is it's like a oh you know and uh <laughs> okay this looks like a mani crossed with like a one of those ducting tubes for like your dryer <laughs> It's a uh, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Um, yeah, you also get stuff like this where it's like, yeah, some people kind of knew what a lion looked like because like most monks had never been to like North Africa before. But then you also get like, uh, uh, <laughs> what is this? Why does it have spots? <laughs> this is not what a lion looks like. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, uh, this is a. Uh... Oh, oh my goodness, this is wonderful. But we also do get like hybrids, like griffins and such. Because yes, please. No, these are like actually like one of the best results of medieval art is just like people get being really creative, like just fantastical creatures. I mean, um, that and also dragons didn't really have like a set image at this point. So it's like yeah, be whatever you want. It's like lizard-ish thing. Maybe with wings, have fun. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good old time, that's for sure. Also, this cat has uh, <laughs> it's seen some stuff. I, um, I think it's had a little too much catnip, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, oh, maybe I shouldn't show that. <laughs> ah, yes, the quote-unquote, a whale. My favorite. <laughs> Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> okay. I think, uh, actually, no, now we're good. Now we can officially start the panel. Because <laughs> this is a. This is a. A thing of beauty. It's a cat. This cat is like, I have this rat. I will take it to this nest of eggs now. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, sweet. Let's get this thing going all my script here all right thank you all very much for coming this is anthropomorphic art history 101 101 i'm docs i am a certified history nerd because i do have a piece of paper saying that um i am a uh, learned in such things as they say you know you're I mean, not so much in like art history but like as far as like the ancient world especially that's very much my jam so like this is something i had a lot of fun just doing in general all right um I should say off the bat, the terms here I'm using here are pretty broad and can't exactly be applied across the board since, you know, societies advance at different rates, you know, it's not just one big old, like, world group or whatever. But, for clarity, um, 
these terms are what I'll be using for this panel, for just, again, the sake of just being simple. Um, this is more like things, I mean, this panel is more like, if your professor showed up a little tipsy to class, you know, just slap this dude on the screen, and was like, yo, check this guy out, he's got all these details, he's representative of this and Miss America, and, and they just gush for like an hour. That's what this is, more or less, you know, minus the alcohol. It's way too early. Um, so, with that further ado, and of course, actually, I do hope that, yeah, not professional, but I do hope that you do get more, a lot of um, educational-ish value out of this, because there's a lot of cool stuff that you might not have known about otherwise. So, so let's begin. Let's start with some of the earliest stuff and talk about how societies have portrayed their surroundings, their relationship and perception of their environment, just in general, which animals are very much a part of. The prehistoric period, by definition, has no writing to tell us what's going on, so we have to interpret what might have been somebody's thought process when making art. Definitely not easy, though, which is why archaeologists often just say, eh, likely used for ritual purposes, which is just code for, I have no freaking clue what this thing is. <laughs> and that's okay. Better to say, I don't know, than assume, you know. We do know that, for animals at least, humans give them meaning. Whether it's dangerous or beneficial or sly or courageous or whatever, they're using characters of animals as like a symbol, especially when you apply them to humans or literally in any language, like see hieroglyphics, for example. So... It would be hard not to start from what's currently the oldest known work of figurative art, the Lewinmensch. This piece of Paleolithic ivory, like it's literally just one solid tusk, from what's now Germany isn't just a testament to human art, it's to how complex our perception of our world is. Oftentimes with prehistoric or even plain historic art, archaeologists will say, like I said, likely used for rituals of purposes. And honestly, we will never know exactly what it was made for or what it represents. But it's important to recognize the power within it. Clearly the figure of the lion meant something to whoever made this. Whatever that power, respect, or the often thrown around fertility, you'll hear that a lot, especially in like ancient prehistoric art, like Paleolithic stuff, the artist was ascribing a layer of symbolic meaning to a human figure. Oh, here we go. You've probably seen this one before. Uh, the Lascaux cave paintings are pretty striking in their presentation of bulls with tiny heads. <laughs> but you probably haven't seen the introvert in the corner. Who am I talking about? It's Bird Dude! <laughs> the bird person has often been described as a shaman of some sort, engaging in magic or sorcery of some kind. Some interpretations believe that this person is in a dream with the bird head representing flight. Maybe the bird TF this guy, I don't know. Burn a stick? It's pretty sus if you ask me. But... More importantly, it may well be an early example of transformation art. Nice. Anatolia is what we call a historical region in what is now Turkey. Many of the oldest Anatolian sites are more zoomorphic in their imagery, you know, animal-shaped, not human-shaped. But it shows how they used animals as symbols. Gobekli Tepe is more of a temple than a settlement, but nonetheless, this structure from around 8,000 BC has an absolute wealth of species. Boars, bears, snakes, foxes, wildcats, birds, and so on. None of which are domesticated. And that's kind of important to note. The focus is not necessarily on hunting, though. These are animals that are dangerous, with their intimidating features like claws or teeth exaggerated. Danger is the only attribute we give to animals, obviously. We also give them roles. Here's another name that's hard for Americans to pronounce. Katalhoyuk, an incredible site from around 6500 BCE, most famously known for its vulture murals. It seems simple enough, vultures eating the heads off of people. But things start to piece together once you start to look at the graves here. More than a few of the bodies are missing their heads, and what seems to be implied is that vultures acted as a sort of gateway to the afterlife. The deceased were exposed to the air, probably somewhere elevated, and vultures would pick away the remains before the bones were buried. There's even a person depicted wearing a vulture skin, presumably as part of the ceremony. Honestly, one of the more fascinating works of art in this period because it's just that there's not really much else like it. The further development is 
once we start getting to like actual historical period is now we're actually getting a mythos. There's stories now attached to these symbols we're throwing around. For example, like with this piece right here, it's the battle of kings against nature. No longer are they just kind of subsidiary or kind of subjugated to the dominion of nature as this big scary thing. You know, they're conquering powerful animals like the lion where before they were kind of cowering in fear. You know, I have conquered the beast and taken its power, hence why lions are associated with royalty in some cases. But we also see the evolution of animals used symbolically into how they're used metaphorically in fables. They, re they represent a specific vice or emotion or even a type of person. And in just in a second, because this is what a lot of people know about, Aesop kind of set the standard for attributes, at least in the Western part of this kind of world, commonly associated with specific animals. I had to at least bring this up a little bit. Egyptian gods? Not as influential as you might have thought. If anything, they were the exception to the deities you normally see in the Mediterranean. They were weird enough that the Greeks tried to explain why the Egyptian gods were a thing. And the best explanation they came up with was that Zeus and company were running around with fursuit heads. Seriously, look it up. But the whole point why they were given animal features was because they, like the hieroglyphics the scribes wrote in, were ideograms. Symbols that represent concepts, not necessarily a particular word. Which is why it was so confusing to read hieroglyphics for a long, long time. Because there's like, oh yeah, it's both symbolic, but also it mean actual words. Hence why Anubis, as the god of the dead, was given the head of a jackal, a scavenger of dead bodies. It was more so to represent that role rather than, oh, he is literally a jackal person, if that makes sense. But you can hear about Egypt literally anywhere, so let's look at something way cooler. Persia. Winged, bull-headed spirit people. Heck yeah. The Lamassu, which is what this is here, is a really neat figure, acting as a sort of protective spirit for people, though, again, usually associated with royalty. You'll see them at the gates of palaces most often, hence why they're also pretty massive. I mean, you're like, look at the size of this thing. Notice how some of them are shown with five legs instead of just four. This was for visual effect. From the front, it appears to be standing, while well, from the side, it's walking. Um, I should point out, uh, by the way, just kind of like a side note, that bulls were often associated with royalty throughout the Near East because they were a status symbol. Owning cattle cost a lot of money, both to maintain and to have enough land for grazing. Therefore, the few people who would afford to have them, you know, that, that kind of luxury, were, were royalty because, yeah, they could afford the labor, the money, all that kind of stuff. Funny enough, though, looping back to the Greeks, they had their own fair share of anthro art and gods, like Pan. Pan is gremlin. Actually, no. Pan is the gremlin. God of chaos, god of nature, god of horny. Hence why I'm only using this image, because the rest are, um, phallic. Very much so. I mean, kind of be expected from a god with goat legs, let's, to be honest. But he's not the only god to dive into the animal realm. Zeus seduced Leto as a freaking swan. Swan kisses, swan kisses, swan kisses! Give him a little smooch! But don't smooch the Minotaur. King Mean also get mad at that. His wide pacifae isn't the only one to be seduced by a bull. Though, to be fair, the Minotaur is... I mean, look at this dude. He's pretty buff. <laughs> so that's a plus. Even as a baby, he was buff. I... I... Okay, here's the thing. The Greeks did not know how to draw children. They just looked like tiny adults, and it's kind of weird. <laughs> you ought to see that a lot if you look at Greek art from, like, the classical period especially. And it's just like, oh. Oh, it's good. <laughs> Also, notice how both the Egyptians and the Greeks pretty much just slapped an animal head on a human body and said, nah, yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> the integration of animal and human characteristics was not a common thing until, like, much later, which we'll get to late in a minute. Okay, so, do you remember Icarus and his dad Daedalus, right? You know, the whole legend about flying too close to the sun, then falling to his death and all that sort of thing. Turns out, Daedalus had a nephew named Paradix. And he was so jealous of Paradox being a better mechanical engineer than him by pushing him off a tower. But Athena was like, nah fam, this guy's smart, I like smart dudes. And saved Paradox by turning him into a partridge. <laughs> I can't get over this picture. Neil just yeets Paradox off this building. Like, Athena's like, oh fuck. <laughs> and just goes, you're bir yeah, you're bird now. Hence why the, oh, but point is, hence why the genus that partridges belong to is called Paradox. Like, literally, that's the origin of it, and oftentimes with animals in particular, 
that's often the case. Like it's some classical reference or it's usually very literal. But nobody had as much influence on anthropomorphic art in tales, at least in Europe, as good old Aesop, my man. The stories themselves weren't necessarily created by him, but like many anthologies of tales, it's a collection of stuff from all over, like India. What? You'd never heard of the Pankatantra? Like one of the most retold collection of stories in South Asia? That's not too surprising because it's practically unheard of in English and Romance language speaking countries. Yet even though we don't know for sure if it had any direct connection to Aesop's fables, they do seem to share more than a few stories, and it covers just as wide a scope of stories and morals. And of course, animals doing human things. Funny enough, even though they were hugely popular from the archaic Greek to the late Roman period, which is like, you know, 800 to 800, um, I couldn't find much art from that period. Likely because it, likely that's because it wasn't preserved in something more durable, like stone or bronze. Hence why most of the art you do see on something like parchment is from the medieval period onward, like we were just looking before stream. It was copied or preserved enough to pass it on, because that's what happened to happen. It's just they kept copying the same text, because it's like, oh, this is worth you know, reading for other people, sort of thing. Though, plenty of Indian works, though, is what we do end up finding. So check out like this particular awesome stone relief from a temple in Karnataka, which is a, a state in southern India. You see stories like this that wrap all the way around some temples. I mean, their temples also survived while the Romans ones didn't, so that may well have something to do with why we end up seeing these stories here versus elsewhere. You know, just some things to think about. We would eventually learn about these stories through Arabian scholars with art that's honestly better than a lot of those coming out of Europe, and it even influenced later storytellers like the Grimm Brothers. Ah, da, da, da. All right, here we go. So that's our baseline. And we just keep progressing from there as we move into the European medieval period. Like I said, kind of generic, but it's one I'm using as kind of like my reference point, so bear with me. The world just kept growing larger, or smaller depending on your point of view, with just about every culture and society having their own form of animal tale. The beginning of human-shaped animal characters as we now know them was where an evolution of Aesop applied just beyond morals into a sometimes political satire. We start seeing either four or two-legged characters from here on out, aka furries by our definition. In fact, what we call furries really started with Reynard the Fox around the 12th century. This French folk figure was a symbol of mischief and slyness, but also Robin Hood-esque in his trials against the aristocracy. In fact, Reynard predates Robin by several centuries, so you could argue that he was the true original every hero, and that the inspiration was the other way around, so. Most of the art you see him is most definitely in parody of something, whether that was the clergy or the popular literature of the time, since, you know, stuff they were kind of reading in the court, you know, for the king and that sort of thing. It's kind of like a, a spoof off of that. It's like, oh, yeah, she's like, you're so grand and all this sort of thing. It's like, ah, I'm just doing all this little stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of what Reynard was. Think of, so, but think of it as like a watershed moment when things started getting meta. It's not just about using animals as literal symbols anymore. It's about how we use and perceive them. So he, this is where that kind of really starts. Yes, literally Robin Hood, but medieval. No, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Robin Hood was technically medieval as well, just a late period. Also, he's adorable. Look at that sass. Ugh, the tail. Love it. It's so good. In this same period, much of the folklore throughout the African continent has been passed down as oral tradition. That's typically how things kind of, you know, were pro progressed throughout this, throughout most of the, at least the northern region anyway. The art that was created alongside it does exist, but unsurprisingly, hasn't been spread nearly as much as European or even East, East Asian art outside of their regions of origin. That said, there is one example that I wanted to share, even though I couldn't find any original art of it. That's the Boltungan or Were Hyena, a fascinating figure that's known from Lake Chad to the Red Sea. The name originates from the Kanuri language, spoken within the Kanem Empire that covered much of what is now the nation of Chad, and they were believed to terrorize and cannibalize locals with a special appetite for lovers. Ethiopian lore claimed that they were usually wizards disguised as blacksmiths and robbed graves in the middle of the night. Somalians, meanwhile, thought that this hyena dude rubbed his butt with a stick to transform himself. 
that might be a bit awkward to do to go back while on hyena form. <laughs> on the other side of the globe, we see another influence that had a major influence in modern times, Japanese folklore. The kitsune is certainly iconic, but it's worth looking at how they're depicted in art. The emphasis is not only on their traits as tricksters, but also their magical powers. They can shapeshift at will, most often into a beautiful woman. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, though. While there's plenty of stories in art where the man marries his fox wife, it's just as often that he gets torn away from his existing family because of it. They're never shown as evil, just not always with the best intentions and minds, and the imagery reflects that. Notice how these pieces have text with them, by the way. Um, this is a common practice that spread originally from China to surrounding countries, and is usually poetry that accompanies the piece. Text and art were usually a little more integrated, if that makes sense. It wasn't just like, oh, here's text, here's art. They kind of like blended together. Calligraphy especially, you know, and that was kind of like very much a thing in East Asia. And around this same time period, the Aztec Empire gets up and running, and we end up with some of the coolest figures in Central American history. Wei Wei Coyote, because, come on, coyotes. He, rep himself, he represented mischief, all right, but was also the song of God of song, dance, and party! Literally, that was his thing. Like many things, what survives is often religious in nature, since these genuine illustrations come from ritual manuscripts written before and after the arrival of the Spanish. And also because the Spanish took a lot of the art, melted down, and all those sort of things. Like, God damn it, pills. Anyway, <laughs> you know what else survived? Bats. Bats were a big deal even during Mayan times, I and mean, that's like more around the time of the Greeks, since they were associated with the divine and luck. A decent number of depictions of a bat god would have stood above the entrance of, of tombs for this reason. This mask in particular is made out of jade, one of my favorite materials in art. I mean, like, just the amount of craftsmanship alone that goes into this sort of thing is just astounding. I love it so much. Okay, though you might be wondering, though, since, you know, I'm talking about the Aztecs in this case, what about up north, like in the Great Plains, for example? You know, where's that? Where, where, where was all that kind of art? Kind of like, what were they doing? Well, keep in mind how art is produced and what it's made out of, like I mentioned with India. Stuff that lasts, and isn't purposely destroyed or melted down, is usually made of stone, metal, or some other durable material. Getting this stuff takes labor, which means a bigger population, something that empires tend to have, like the Aztecs. Animal skins, wood, and plant-based material don't require a giant workforce, which would have been the case in the Great Plains region, for example, but they don't tend to last very long. Hence why a lot of the art we see from Native American um, groups in, say, South Dakota or something like that tend to be from, like, 200 years ago at the oldest. All right. You knew this was coming. How could I not at least mention friggin' dragons? They're so cool! Look at this lad! Look at him! Absolute unit. I love it. Dragons have their roots in Greek lore. Think, like, sea serpents and such. With the spread of Christianity in Europe... Which were often they were, so they were often connected with the devil. So kind of like how animals in general were given attributes, drag dragons were just plain evil. As such, any and all art about them is wild. Oh, geez, I didn't. Oh, I messed that up. I went to do two images there. Oh well, because there's there's no canon image of what a dragon is supposed to look like, at least for a while. Like nowadays, we kind of have like a set image of how they're supposed to appear, but that's a pretty recent development, all things considered. Ah, na, na, na. All right, so you probably noticed that most cultures in the world have at least some form of anthropomorphic art. Not too surprising. I mean, humans are humans, after all. But when are we going to get into the really furry stuff? I know you're all looking forward to that. But, well, as it happens, the origins of furry fandom would come mostly from Western sources starting in the 19th century, because guess who had the power of the industrial revolution behind them to mass-produce all those books and comics? Yep the major European powers, and the United States. Old stories were brought to the masses in collections by the brothers Grimm and Jean de la Fontaine, who's another kind of story collector, putting Germanic, Greek, Roman, French, even English tales at the tips of millions of people. That's mass production, what's also the reason why Alice in Wonderland and its sequel, Through the Looking Glass, um, were read so widely throughout the world, aside from being actually good, 
honestly would have just been as big of an influence as Lewis Carroll's writing were John Tenniel's illustrations. He'd been honing his skills as a political cartoonist beforehand, and that's pretty apparent when you just look at the faces he drew. Animal characters are just as good at delivering clear messages, because like characters of people, you're not concerned about pesky things like anatomy that would look wrong on a person. Animals are as symbols and metaphor, once again. The 20th century took that idea and turned it up to 11. The invention of moving pictures, you know, movies, films, created yet another medium to distribute through, and gave rise to the juggernaut that is now Disney. In all reality, the main reason why animal characters are often associated with kids' content now is because of the sheer influence of Disney and his very specific vision for his company and his products. Old stories were retold, often sanitized, for the American mass market, with the goal of making it as appealing as possible to as wide of an audience as possible. That clean image was pretty actively defied, though, because Disney was not the only powerhouse at that time. Warner Brothers, Hanna-Barbera, UPA, Jay Ward? They all acted as the foil to the kid-friendly Disney. You know, they, there was competition. Even in the comics field that Disney dominated in the 1950s, there was competition. Pogo was a continuation of long-use techniques for animal characters. Satire and biting at that. I'm talking like political cartoon sort of jabs, even though you wouldn't expect that sort of thing from cute, fuzzy swamp animals. I mean, this was a really popular comic at the time, by the way. That's all America, though. We're not even talking about, like, anywhere in Europe or Japan, because the way cartoon animals were used and perceived was way different. Let me give an example. You've probably heard of Kimbo the White Lion, yeah? You might not be as familiar with its creator, Osamu Tezuka, whose credit would pretty much kickstarting the modern manga industry. The main point here, though, is that he wrote his stories like he would a book. Something really engaging, an actual story, not just a fairy tale. Even if they were animals, they could be played the part in whatever drama he was writing. Oh yeah, no, 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 I'm not freaking about Max Fleischer, trust me. I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to annotate for time, mostly. That does leave one big question, though. Where do furries come into the picture? Everything beforehand has really, hasn't really been a fandom. It's just been people using animals for whatever suits their purpose, not as their, like, one and only focus. Well, to figure that out, we got to start in another fandom. Comics. Long story short, a handful of fans were really bored in the late 60s of all the superhero fanzines. The artsy ones among them wanted to draw in zines because they found the stuff in like Mad Magazine, Robert Crumb, and Von Baudet to be way cooler and funnier than the relatively steam clean stuff coming out of like DC and Marvel at the time. So they were like, oh, well, might as well start our own zine. So they did. A, a, a satirical, not at all serious zine called Voodie, where you could talk about how mind-blowing Watership Down was all you wanted. Like, it's not exactly all professional-grade art in its pages, but you can tell where the influences are. Underground comic references everywhere. Think of it as more akin to an art channel on Discord with added commentary. I mean, that's more or less the kind of vibe that was going on, the sort of thing. You know, it's where people come to, like, hang out, share their stuff in their art, and just kind of talk, you know, provide feedback for, like, whatever people drew from the previous issue. So kind of like in slow motion. No thanks to this little collective, we end up with, like, one of the probably the more famous older furry comics, anyway, Omaha the Cat Dancer, one of the OGs of furry comics, guiding us through a human melodrama with engaging characters. All furry. This was catalyst number one. But wait, oh, there's more. We can't be thinking about all our friends in science fiction and fantasy fandom now, can we? Because honestly, it proved to be just as influential. Just look at the stats for how many furs consider themselves fans of science fiction. And we could trace it back to two people, Farah Shimbo and Steve Galachi. Around the end of the 70s, Fa decided to publish this massive anthology of stories centered around her own universe called Snow on the Moon. Intricately detailed worlds, unique species, many of them which were animal-like, and well-written stories. Thank you. Finding good fanfiction is harder than it seems sometimes. Meanwhile, around the same time, we got our good friend Steve Galachi on the scene. With his fair share of underground comics, old-school science fiction novels, and a healthy number of Star Wars screenings, he was inspired to drop up his most well-known comic series, Irma Felna EDF which was part of his bigger anthology, Albedo Anthropomorphics, which some of you might at least heard of. You can really see his origins as a graphic specialist in the Air Force with his art, which comes up as very technical and really enforces some of the realism. 
This was catalyst number two. But Nani, there's more? Of course there is, you silly. You forgot about anime fans. There's crossover with American animation fans here as well, since there was already huge backlog from the past 50 years, but also because movies like Watership Down and Secret of Nim were just coming out in theaters at this point. These, and the very first of the Miyazaki films, created a pretty decent fan base by like 1980. Oh, and let's not forget about Baggy, the monster of mighty nature, because she probably made as many people furries as anything else. I mean, like, come on. And finally, that brings us to proper furry art. I could probably do a whole panel on just the art scene within the pages of early fan scenes from the 80s, but just know that the three big artists were Ken Sample, Jerry Collins, and Steve Martin. Their art was almost always there if you wanted attending furry parties at the time, you know, in the mid-80s here. So it's what most people recognize as, like, definitively furry art. Note the mix of influences from America as well as Japanese animation and comics. That's not to leave in the dust creators like Jim Grote, creator of Equine the Uncivilized and Red Shetland. Horse furs, this is your origin point. <laughs> That and potentially Tars, which are popular enough to have their own zine. But this right here is the critical mass. It's from here on out that we start seeing the art films, you know, whether they're fan or professional, that we know today. Yes. So, I went through this panel way faster than I thought. And that's really a, a, most of what I wanted to go through, at least. Because... Oh my god, that was still a lot of stuff, all things considered, and honestly, for like probably future panels, I'll probably have to add more detail, because I didn't think I'd have, to, I'd have enough time to go through all this, but I must have just spoken fast enough. But, um, that's honestly deserves its own panel, like for just the furry stuff too, and honestly, I might consider doing that at some point. But, um, if any of you have any questions about stuff you want me to dig into further for this panel, since we actually have extra time... Um, let me know, because I really do appreciate everyone showing up for this. Because, oh my goodness. That actually went really fast. Wow. Nice. I was speed running it. Oh, goodness. Yeet, yeet. <laughs> I mean, okay, I will say this. I did speech when I was in high school. That's literally, like, my only credentials for, like, speaking. So, like, I think that at least helped with, like, yeah, the stuttering problem. Because, yeah, once I, if I can read from a script, then it's like, yeah, I can just go, you know. <laughs> I mean, oh, leaving more than 30 minutes ever by an hour and 30 minutes in history class. <laughs> I mean, I try to, like, you know, give it, um... The main thing about, like, like, that I've noticed, like, when people say, like, oh, I don't like history. I said, how is your professor? Because, like, nine times out of ten, they don't like history classes because their professors don't know how to teach history. You know what I mean? Because, like, you need to be able to, like, make it engaging and show, like, kind of like how there's a story behind it. You know? It's like, because there's, there's connections, not just, like... George Washington did this, did this in 1789. He wasn't for the Constitution. I was like, no, that's not how it works. That doesn't really work. You know, that's just not really good history. You know, because that doesn't help you explain like why it's important. This may be a weird question to deal with. If if, if when the furry stand started, members were just really queer like they are today. Ooh, ooh, that is a very good question. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So actually, I will answer this really quick. Okay. Quick history lesson, since we're here, children. Um, so, you can kind of, like, fudge the number for when furry fandom really started. You could say 1976, because that's when Voodie started. You could say 1980, because that's when people figured out Steve Galachi was doing really cool stuff. You could say 1985, because that's when the first, like, quote-unquote furry parties were starting. You know? So, it really just depends on, like, how you want to define it. But, like, even for those three... Um, it was not disproportionately queer, actually. In the original, in the beginning, it was actually you were actually more like um, the average science fiction fan, which again they were like it was usually a thirty-year-old white dude who had gone to college and makes a decent living enough to go to conventions like several times a year. 
You know, like that was like the average person, and he's usually a straight guy, more often than not. Hence why a lot of the early furry art tends to be cheesecake art, you know, like pinups of like girls and such. But that would change because of the internet. <laughs> because um, the thing is with the internet, and again, this is a kind of a big deal, and I will show you art of this. Actually, you know what? Let me pull this up just for you. I can actually find this stuff. Um, all right, let me pull this up here. Hang on, I can get this here. Pull up the con book for 1991, why not? Okay, so I'm just looking at a couple of the images here. Oh wait, shit, I forgot. Oh crap, I swore. Ah, that was my one swear, promise. <laughs> Oh, wait, it is working. Cool. All right. So if you look at this collection of images here, notice how um, a lot of the characters in here are female. Again, this is 1991, you know, just for reference. So this is really before the big influx of people from the internet. And these are people like who were using things like Furry Muck, which was like an online role play service, because the main deal why the, why the uh, people, queer people came from online is because it gave them a place to explore their identity safely. Um, and so when they found out about Conference, which was the first free convention to happen, basically, around like 1993 or so, there's this huge influx of young gay guys, basically. <laughs> um, and they basically kind of like changed the demographic, more or less, to being more, and I can show you here... Pretty sure. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, do I have it? Oh, I could find like two seconds. Hang on. Yeah, here it is. I could find it. Eh, I can't find exactly which, but basically. They would actually like it would it would change kind of like what the art looked like, especially. So yeah, look at well pin up up uh, pin up art of guys, for example. So that's just something that's kind of a question. So no, it wasn't always queer, but it became that way eventually, and you saw that reflected in the art of the time. Um, let me see. Okay, could you explain more about the reaction of Greeks and Egyptians? Okay, so the problem that the Greeks had was that they couldn't read hieroglyphics. They could ask Egyptians to read it for them, and generally they, they just basically believed whatever the Egyptians told them was true. Because like, oh yeah, no, they're always truthful, they speak to gods because they're very religious people, so they should, they, they're very, probably truthful. But that's why they end up with a lot of like false stories about like what goes on in the world and like why the Nile rises and all that sort of thing. Like, oh, it rises because of the wind. What? <laughs> but... Um, um, but basically, the Greeks did, really just could not quite understand why the Egyptians would worship gods with animal heads. Like, they said, oh, that doesn't make sense. Why would the gods not look like humans? That's just what they're supposed to look like, you know? Because the Greek pantheon was supposed to re reflect society, and vice versa, you know? It's not that they didn't have animal characters or animal-like things in their own society, but they were not like the main gods, if that makes sense. So that was kind of, that was more or less the dichotomy that was going. Let's see here. Do you know when the first furry con happened and what did the booths and the panels were looked at look like? Ooh, I can actually probably, I don't know if I can find any photos on me right now, but basically a lot of the booths actually were um, open tables. They're like round tables, basically, where like there was not like a person in front talking down to everyone. It was like everyone was kind of like congregated around several round tables and they all like took part in like a collective discussion which is kind of a really weird thing to do in conventions at the time. You know, no one had really done that before anywhere. And so, like, a lot of those kind of panels were looked a little more collective in that sense. I mean, you probably did have traditional panels as well. But, um, yeah, they were just kind of like a different format, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, if you want, I can go ahead and drop a link to this archive. In fact, I'll just do that here really quick. Um... In, in the chat here, and you can look at all this sort of paraphernalia from like, or not paraphernalia, but like um, ephemera, I should, that's what I should say, from like, you know, the early period, especially like all the stuff that was actually physical from the time, which is really cool. Um, 
let me see here. Was there more animals with religions or is like within religions or is like like with wealth? I mean, to use an example, let me go dragon aristocracy. And I can show you this really quick. Royalty. Um, if I could find it, uh, what's the, what's the word? Heraldry. That's what I'm looking for. Yes. Okay. So let me use since no one's asking about animals within religions or like a status of wealth. Okay. So, like with the Welsh dragon, for example, this is a case where animals were kind of used as a symbol for an entire nation for Wales. Because there was this legend where two dragons were, were dug up out of the ground. And it was a white and a red dragon. The white represented um, England and the red represented um, Wales. And ultimately, the white dragon won. And Merlin said, oh, eventually the red one will come back and defeat the white dragon. So it's kind of like saying, like, Wales will win again eventually. So it's kind of used in that sense as well. Could you explain how furries tied in with the internet today? Ooh, that's a... That's a long story, but I, I mean, I, I could tie it in with the internet today. I mean, to give a very, very brief description, um, let me put it this way. Basically, we, we were some of like the really early adopters of the internet, to be perfectly honest. Um, early internet, here we go. I'll put this on as a backdrop while we talk about this. Because we were using what were called BBSs or bulletin board services, where you really had to like dial in to other people's computers to like leave messages and talk and all that sort of thing. And so then when the internet came around, it was basically just a further evolution of that. But the whole time, we were using personas, which is a brand new idea that came about in like the mid to late 80s as like a known name thing. Um, as characters on these online rooms. You know, we use it to represent us as our avatar and role play, or just as us as our username, whatever. But it was a tool. We could use it to kind of like toy a little bit with, with identity, that sort of thing, whether that was gender or sexuality or whatever. And so with that, you started to see more of that influx, like I said, of LGBT people. And I wish I could find a good example is I don't have it on hand, which sucks. I didn't prepare for that part. Um, uh, I could probably. In fact, let me do this one. Because, I mean, let me pull it up here. Yeah, like this is from like, what, 1981? And it's already talking about this sort of like, it's kind of like a transhumanist sort of thing, where it's kind of like, hey, look, we're, you know, we like this sort of thing, and we imagine ourselves as these characters. So like, oh, someday, we may all day, one day be funny animals. This is from Tim Fay, for example, really well-known artist from the time as well. And it was just really cool stuff too. Because like, again, this is some like original stuff they were writing, like this is a Denver con, 1981. You know, and again, this is just a collective of stuff. Like, oh my god, this is from Ken Fletcher, who was like one of the big people in Voodie, that one fanzine from the 70s. And it's just memes. It's just memes. All of memes. Oops, all memes. <laughs> oh my goodness. But yeah, I mean, I, I seriously recommend looking at some of this stuff sometime because it's really cool. Like, here's some more Steve Galachi stuff. But anyway, I've gone on for about 45 minutes. Unless there's any other questions you all have for me, I'm probably about, yeah, ancient personas. No, literally, they were ancient personas, like some of the first. Because it's just kind of like, and they didn't call them that at the time. I think the original term they used was um, a personal furry. <laughs> that was literally like the original term for some of this stuff. <laughs> ancient memes ancient memes oh my goodness this is so freaking anime 
It was from like 1977. Holy shit, it was 1981. Oh my goodness. Because yeah, I mean, you could just see all the sort of crossover that's going on. You got people coming from anime. You got people coming from like traditional comics like Marvel and such. You have people coming in from like this weird underground sort of thing where it's like this really weird sense of humor. It's just like, oh, I, don't know, I don't know about this dude. You also got people coming from like European comics. It's like, oh yeah, Aardvark. I didn't even talk about Aardvark. Ah, oh, crap, I should have done that. But like here's Asterix and Obliques, like two well-known European comics. Because yeah, I mean, I, I will say this one more thing: comics in Europe, especially, were seen as like a very much a general audience thing. Like Asterix, for example, was very much like a for everybody because it was just genuinely funny, you know. I, I don't. Yeah, Aardvark was just a fun one too. Yeah, no, no, no. This it's just super cool stuff, especially like for some of the stuff where it's like you can see where it eventually ends up because like some of it is just like. Oh, that's totally a persona. Totally. It's, okay, I don't care if it's from 81, but it's totally that. Was there any argument between werebeasts and furries? Honestly, I don't know much about that conversation. I knew it was a thing in, like, the early 90s where, like, werewolves were, like, becoming suddenly becoming, like, a popular thing. Like, there was literally, like, a werewolf fandom in the, in the 90s. And, God, I, I, that I wish I had heard of. And, honestly, I might... Ooh, ooh, I might have some art of that. We'll see. Oh yeah, here's some. Yeah, werewolves. Cause honestly, like, it was, I mean, if people were trying to like nitpick names like that, it was because at the time they just didn't like some of the things were coming off along with the term furry at the time. And a lot of that kind of dissension often came from within, and I was just picked up at like the general like media. I was like, "Oh wow, look at these people!" <laughs> but really, like those those stereotypes actually just came up with people who just didn't like the fact that there were a lot of like, you know, gay guys in the con space. For really, for lack of a better term. Oh man, here's actually a really good point, and I'll mention this really quick. Um, because of werewolf fandom, actually, you did see a kind of a resurgence of interest in kind of like neo-medieval art, for lack of a better term. You know, because essentially people kind of like going back to the past for, um, um, what's, the, what's the term? Just for inspiration, you know, because like, okay, yeah, we look at these like these medieval pieces, now I'm going to take it and put it into my own style. Because like furries, for example, okay, yeah, we were fans of anime and comics and all those sort of things, but like, oh no, now we define ourselves as furries, so let's look at everything that came before and, um, kind of figure out like what we can do with it so like in the 90s you saw even more influences coming from just about everywhere it's like oh my god there's just way too much way too much like fantasy was big fantasy was huge because like if it was science fiction in the beginning then eventually it was like mythology later like it just it was just kind of like a thing for a while Ha da 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 also, centaurs. Centaurs have always been a thing. Which, I mean, which might be kind of, like, mind-blowing. Yeah, neo-medieval. I just made that up. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been, like, there's literally, like I said, I brought up at the end, there's, like, a, a fanzine in the 80s just for centaurs. And it's, like, one of the first ones to come out. So it's, like, it's always been, like, this kind of, like, underlying interest for people. Which is really interesting, to be honest. Because, like, I mean, I'm not, like, a guitar person, but I was like, oh, this is actually pretty cool. <laughs> oh, there's Pan. There, there's the meme lord right there. Along with a very kind of, like, griffin looking dragon here. But, yeah, I mean, because, like, you, you could pick through this sort of stuff all, like, all day. Literally all day. Because it's just awesome. There's so much to it. Ah, uh, yes, barbarian art, my favorite. Yes, again, more werewolves. Just really popular at this point. But, uh, I think we're about good here. Yeah, we're at 50, I think I can call it. Once again, I want to thank everybody for showing up to this. This has been an absolute blast. I recognize that I, I went through the actual panel way faster than I thought I would, and so I kind of got a little disorganized toward the end, but I still really appreciate people for showing up to this. This was a lot of fun to do. How wholesome are furry hugs? The most wholesome. Don't you doubt it. Don't do it. Don't. They're the wholesome ones. Can't even deny it. <laughs> Alrighty. I'm logging off, everybody. Thank you again for coming, and I will see you back 
in the con space. 